It's pretty interesting around our house. Open your Bibles, if you would, this morning. We are in 2 Corinthians. We've come to chapter 8 here. We're going to look at the first six verses this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. And if you outline, like outlines, um, this book itself is is broken up into three parts. Um, the first seven chapters that we've been studying, and then chapters eight and nine, they, both these chapters go together. I don't know if you've ever sat down and read these two chapters together, but you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the Word of God to read both of these chapters together and don't make any conclusions or applications until you get all the way over to chapter nine, verse 15. Once you read all these verses, then you can start making applications, but take it all in. It's uh, important for us to read God's Word, sometimes in its entirety. Sometimes, you know, we like to break verses down here and get into these words and what these words mean and, this, and you know, the, how these sentences are structured, and we'll do some of that uh, this morning as we go through this verse by verse, but as well, you know, read all this together. This is important. These are two very important chapters in the New Testament. And I was off. I took a little bit of time off to chase my son around. We went to some of his football games. So a few Sundays that I was off, well, I just found a few books to read as well to help me put these two chapters in their context in the New Testament and really helped me to see how all these churches were connected. <clears throat> We say, well, the Romans, you know, they knew the Romans or the, you know, the Corinthians knew the Corinthians, but they knew each other. You read, you read the other letters of the New Testament, you'll find out that the folks in these other churches knew the folks in these other churches. And these are very important things here that we've come to this morning here in chapter 8. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1. I'll read down through verse 6. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear witness, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, beseeching us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we besought Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Father, we look into your word this morning and we ask your blessings upon it. Open our hearts and our ears and our eyes and our minds to the truth of your word. Move us forward in your program, we pray in Jesus' name. And this is one continuous section. goes all the way over, as I mentioned, to chapter 9 and verse 15. Sometimes, you know, we interrupt God. You know, we're, it's like, you know, Moses interrupted God. And God tried to begin to tell him what he wanted him to do. And Moses said, hold on, time out, God. You Don't you know I stutter? You know, so Moses interrupted God, and there were others like Peter. Remember Peter, he he interrupted the Lord. He grabbed the Lord and began to rebuke the Lord and said, not so, and things like that, and he interrupted Jesus. So there are times that we, we need to listen, and we need to let God speak, and we need to let God finish speaking. And when it comes to giving, those are one of those subjects where we need to listen to God and keep our eyes and our minds open what he has to say about these things. And this is just a grand section on giving in the New Testament. There are other sections on giving, and they all tie into this one, but this one's sort of uh, where we've got a lot of things in a lot of ways for us. And the interesting thing is that, you know, it's kind of like it is with the Word of God. You know, sometimes you know, God's word is just, you know, like I said, we need to let God finish speaking sometimes and listen to him. He's the one, you know, he's the creator and we're the creature. So we, we want to say, speak, Lord. We want to hear, speak, Lord. 
We want to listen. Speak, Lord. We want to let you finish what you have to say. And we want to obey you, and we want to do what you want to do. Well, here we have two chapters, all these verses on giving. And guess what? The word money is never mentioned. What an irony. You know, if I was going to preach on money or I was going to teach on money, I'd at least would have probably used the word a few times over and over. But Paul talks about giving here, and Paul, talk, Paul talks about money here, but he never mentions the word money. That fascinates me. But he does say things like the gift. Down there in chapter 8, verse 4, he mentions the gift. And that's the money that Paul's talking about here. The, the, uh, the same grace also, down at the end of verse 6, uh, up in chapter 1, where he says the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. That's, those are words and phrases that Paul uses down through here uh, over and over again for us to see the grace of God, what's going on here in this chapter. And by the time we get to Acts chapter 11, those of you that were with us last week remember that we sort of chronologically went through Acts, and when we got to chapter 11 of Acts, that's where uh, Luke begins to talk about this famine that hit the churches there uh, throughout the Middle East. And by now, it's 57 AD when Paul writes this, by now we've got three, or excuse me, we've got churches on three different provinces in the Middle East, Macedonia and, you know, the churches that were up in, in Philippi that, and, and Thessalonica that Paul is talking about here, the churches of Macedonia, those are the ones that Paul is talking about. Then we have the church over in Corinth. Uh, the, the, the book of Romans is going to be written right after 2 Corinthians, so Paul has Rome on his mind. So the gospel is spreading. The churches are growing. There are more churches. There are more Christians there's a lot of these things going on in the New Testament. Well, one of the big things that needs to be dealt with and, and understood is giving. So we have two chapters here, chapter 8 and chapter 9, that are on giving. And the section that we just read this morning here, in these first six verses, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, we, we make known to you. So he's pointing out this example that this church was to the Corinthians. So that's what Paul's doing. He's pointing to us an example, an example to follow. And examples are very important things to follow. That's why we have the Lord Jesus to follow. We've got the Gospels to follow him. He's our perfect example. And here we have an example of giving, and Paul's drawing attention, and he addresses the whole congregation because he says, brethren, he doesn't call out any specific people. He addresses the whole congregation. So he says, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. So we got a, an example for us to see today. So what's our example for giving? Here it is. You know, this church and, and these verses and what Paul says here, this is, a, you know, an example for us to follow. Now, if you like to break these down in outlines and uh, here's another one for you, all the way from chapter 7, or excuse me, chapter 8, verse 7, all the way over to verse 15, is the exhortation to give. So we have the example to give, we have the exhortation to give, and then from verses 8, 16, all the way over to 9, 5, we have the explanation of giving. Paul is going to give us a lot of details on giving in that section. And then finally, in verses 9, chapter 9, uh, verses 6 through 15, we have the encouragement to give. So there's the outline for these two chapters. And the mother church in Jerusalem was the topic of what Paul's going to speak about uh, as we get over there and, and we read chapters uh, 8, verse 16 through 24 here in a minute. We'll read that, but uh, we're going to see there that you know, that, that's some of the things that were going on. The early churches wanted to send relief to the mother church in Jerusalem. And that's where the church began. Where did the church begin? It began in Jerusalem. You know, there's a particular denomination out there that thinks the church begun in Rome. They think the, the church is headquarters in Rome. That's not so. The church did not begin at Rome. The church began in Jerusalem. And it was Jerusalem where these poor saints that Paul 
is talking about where these poor saints were that needed the help. So Paul is encouraging this, the, the Corinthian church uh, to give. And he does a very good job of it. Now, from chapter uh, 1 through chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians, he, he's been dealing with a lot of different things. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna slow down or back up and look at any of those things, but 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 Paul uh, was very concerned with the church and the things that were going on in the church that he wrote about in the first letter, and he had hoped that they would listen to him, and he had hoped that they would do the things that he had said to do in order to put the church back uh, in, in right standing before God and right standing before one another, and that's what the church did. And he says in verse uh, 16 of that chapter 7, he says, I rejoice therefore, and I have confidence in you in all things. So it had been restored to the apostle. So on the heels of that, Paul says, now that you're restored, now that I have confidence in you, now that we've got these things behind you, Paul says, I want to encourage you to give. And here's what I want you to give for, the reasons, and he lays all those things out. So this moreover here, it sort of marks a transition um, Maybe your Bible translated moreover to now. So Paul says, now, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God. So that's what Paul is doing. And, you know, he, you're like me. You like, you like doctrine. You like the way Paul writes Romans. You like the way Paul writes Hebrews. You like doctrinal things. You want to learn about God and about ourselves and about what's going on. Well, there are times where Paul didn't write things that were doctrinal, you know. This is very practical, and that's what he's saying. I'm coming off this, so uh, I want you to practice these things. You know, what's our doctrine without our practice? So Paul says, here's what I want you to do, and he encourages them to give. And he says, I want to, I cause you to know this, so let me draw your attention to this very thing. And the thing that Paul is drawing their attention to is giving. And he says, I want you to practice giving in this way, and he lays it all out here for them in these two uh, wonderful chapters. So, again, uh, it's, it's going back to the mother church. Uh, the churches in Macedonia that he's talking about up there in verse 1, the churches of Macedonia, that's Philippi, Thessalonica, and remember the Bereans. The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonicans, remember? They, they went home and searched the scriptures to see if these things were so or not. So, those are the three churches that Paul's talking about here that, that the grace of God was bestowed upon these churches in Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. So there's nowhere in the New Testament where the apostles or God institutes or even discusses tithing. You know, that's a word that a lot of people like to use, and a lot of people like to refer to that as giving. There, there is nothing in this section here in, in this, these two chapters or the New Testament on tithing. In fact, it's quite the contrary to that. So the practice he wants them to implement here, there's, there's no commands. He says down through this section, and we looked at some of these last week, but uh, Paul says um, over in chapter 8, verse 12, he says, for if there be first a willing mind, okay, this is not, Tithing or taxing. God is looking for a willing mind. No commands, no rules, just generosity. So that's what God's looking for. A willing mind, a generous mind. That's what God wants. That's, that's the motive in our giving, is a generous mind. And again, this example that he gives us here in these first six verses, again, he's, he doesn't command them. He doesn't plead. He doesn't say, you know, this has to happen. He's just giving them an example, and he follow up the example with the uh, exhortation to give. So that's what Paul wants. So some, some, of our le some of our lessons from last week, one of the big ones was, you know, what if we get this wrong? You know, what's at stake? If we get this wrong, well, there's a lot at stake. You know, it's like your salvation. What if we get the gospel wrong? What if we get this wrong? What God has said, then there's a lot at stake. You know, it might be your eternal soul. 
So we got to we, we want to listen to God. We want to understand and know what the gospel is. We want to believe the gospel. We want to partake of that. We want to be born again. We want to have this salvation. But what's at stake when it comes to giving and giving the proper way? If you remember from last week, those of you that were here, it's a it's hinted at over here in chapter 8 and verse 23. Clear at the end of that verse, Paul says, the glory of Christ. So that's what's at stake here if we don't get this right. This is the glory of Christ, and he's going to expand on that. And you remember last week I, we, we spoke about how God in Genesis, remember, it becomes very apparent by the time we get to Genesis chapter 12 where God says to Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And then God says, I'm going to make, a, I'm going to make you a blessing to all the other nations. Okay, that's Isaiah. That's the Psalms. That's, that's the Old Testament. So Paul uses, uh, if you will, over in chapter 8, verse 15, he says, As it is written, he that has gathered much has nothing over, and he that has gathered little had no lack. So Paul uses an Old Testament verse to say, Look, church, God has promised to bring the wealth of the Gentiles in and bless you with it. So that's what Paul wants. He wants Gentile Christians to give to the mother church in Jerusalem and to help them. And he says, God said this was going to happen. He said it way back in the Old Testament. So Paul wants to get their eyes and their minds above just money and, and offerings to see that what's at stake here is the glory of God and the souls of men. That's why he says here at, at the end that in verse 23 there, the glory of Christ. So that's that's what's at stake here is the glory of Christ, the souls of men, the Gentile nations. That's what's at stake if we don't get this right. So Paul sets it all out here for us and allows us to see these things. And remember last week I spoke about, too, the, the generosity of God. That's where this starts. You know, don't start thinking about chapters 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians until you start thinking about the generosity of God. You say, well, I didn't know God was generous. Well, then you haven't read the Word of God. We need to get in the Word of God and see just how generous God is. That's what the Psalms are for. You know, some of you know um, Stephen Charnoff. He, that guy has written some of the most incredible things about God that I've ever read. He did a whole volume on the attributes of God. You want to get in over your head, grab one of his books and start reading it. The man's phenomenal. He's dead and gone. But here's a man writing on the things of God, the attributes of God. And you say, well, how did he learn about this God? How did he learn so much about God? He read his Bible. He got in these Psalms that were, you know, that we read this morning. And they're incredible. These Psalms talk, talk about this great God that has made this heaven and earth that you and I are standing on. And this God has given to us an eternity. It's waiting on us. That's this eternal life. And, and he, Jesus said that, you know, that one soul was worth what? The entire world. So one soul was worth the entire world. That's what Spurgeon said about his ministry. He said, if I, I served my whole life and only one person got saved, he said it'd be worth it because one soul is worth more than the entire world. So that's the value of a soul. That's the value of human beings. And that's what Paul's saying here. That's the value of our giving. That's what our giving needs to be about. And our giving needs to be toward is the glory of God and the, and the saving of people, both in our own community and around the world. That's the great commission. That's what the church has forgotten. Paul says here, that's the glory of of Christ. And God is a great giver. Look over in chapter 9, verse 15. He says, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. God is a generous and great giver. Read Genesis chapter 1. Read Matthew chapter 1. How can you not read the Bible and say, God is not a generous God? 
You're not being fair. So God is a generous God, and that's what Paul says in verse 1, the grace of God. That's what this is. This is the grace of God. What motivates us to give willingly? Not commands, but the grace of God. That's what Paul says here in verse 1. And he's a generous God, too. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. And Paul says in 1 Timothy, God gave us richly all things to enjoy. So if you're not enjoying what God's given you, it's your fault, not his. So these are the riches that God has given us. That's incredible, the, the wealth that, 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 that is out there that God has just handed off to the human race at great cost to himself. But this generous God, this grace of God, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. When we talk about giving and motivating, that's where we got to start right there is with the generosity of God. And that's where Paul starts. He says in verse 16 of chapter 8, Thanks be to God who put the same earnest care upon the heart of Titus for you. So thank God for his great gift. Honor the divine giver. That's what we're to do. Honor this God. Worship this God. Praise this God. Sing to this God. Love this God. Open your hearts and mind to this God. That's what we're to do. Paul says, this is the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. So, you know, God is still pouring his grace out on us, isn't he? It didn't dry up. So as God continues to pour his grace out on them, and his grace out on us, and his grace out on the foreign mission field, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just a manifestation of the grace of God that gets Paul excited up there in verse 1, should motivate us to give from a willing mind and heart. So what do we receive? We've received a lot from God. What have we received from God? We, pastor's last message he just left here was that all the things that are in Christ, the treasures in Christ and everything that's in Christ. And as Paul put it in Ephesians chapter 1, that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Everything's in Christ. So God made it real easy for us. He put everything in Christ. The grace of God is in Christ. And the grace of God made this possible. The grace of God made this real. And if you're saved and you heard the gospel and you've been transformed out of darkness and into light, out of death and into life, you've been born again, by the grace of God, you know what Paul's talking about here. It's, a, it's an important thing. As we look back over our lives, years of vanity and pride, as the song says. But God saved me out of all those things, and the grace of God is bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia here that Paul talks about. And these, these churches do. Um, if you look down at the end of verse 5, he says, the will of God. That's what churches do. Churches do the will of God. We're not here to do our will. We're not here to do my will. We're here to do God's will. And God's will is that we be occupied with the glory of Christ and the souls of men and be giving and receiving and praying and taking part of these things. And Paul says in verse 2 here, how that in the great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto them the riches of their liberality. So the how connects of what Paul says here back to verse 1. This is the state of this congregation. You say, well, you know, if they're giving a lot and all this, and it must be a bunch of rich people. No, not at all. Here's the state of this congregation right there in verse 2. You know, the early church suffered a lot, you know, and that's one thing that I learned looking and trying to put all this in its own context is just how much the early church suffered. You want to read how much the early church suffered? Read the book of Acts. It's there. And the early church suffered a lot. And chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 8, verse 2 talks about those trials. 
They suffered socially. They suffered politically. They suffered financially. They suffered physically. Some were even put in prison. Paul wrote Colossians from prison. Paul wrote 2 Timothy from prison. Paul wrote Romans from prison. So there were a lot of Christians who were in prison. The, the, the state of the early church was uh, not much like it is today, with the prosperity gospel out there. Um, and it went very far in the early church. But they suffered greatly. And that's what he says here, the great trial of affliction, the testing of affliction. And you remember Jesus said that. The early, the early apostles thought, man, following Jesus, we're going to sit on the right hand and on the left hand. You know, they were lifted up in pride. They thought, you know, being a Christian was going to be a, a great thing in the world. Jesus had to remind them, no. He said, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? And he was talking about the persecution and the suffering and the hardships that he went through. And the early church was similar. He went through uh, similar things. And guess what Romans chapter 5 calls that? The trials of our faith is, does what? It brings experience. And what do we want when we hire somebody? We want somebody with experience. Well, lots of Guess what? Christians have lots of experience. How did we get it? Trials and tribulation. There's no other way, you know. There's no other way. And trials and tribulations bring experience to the Christians. That's what Romans chapter 5 says. That's what Paul is saying here. The great trial of affliction. They went through it too. So Christian experience is trials and trials and more trials. Guess what we have after trials? More trials. Until we die. Then there'll be no more trials. Then it'll be glory. So, you know, here's what's going on. You, you would have thought, well, you know, based upon this church here in chapter 8, verse 2, looking at what Paul says here, this probably would have been the group that you would have never asked anything from. Why? Because of what they were going through. But that didn't stop them from being generous, even in their great affliction. So even when you're under trial and in great affliction, that's not a time to stop giving. That is a time to give. That's the great lesson out of chapter 8 and verse 2. And they were, if you look over in chapter 9, verse 7, God loves a cheerful giver. So in the middle of all that affliction, and all those difficulties there in verse 2, they were still cheerful givers. And Paul says the abundance of their joy or their excess joy, their excess joy and their liberality, their riches there, as he says it there in verse 2. So these Christians, even though they were in all this poverty and, all, and these great trials uh, going on in their lives, they, they were not associating their joy with their circumstances. You know, our joy comes beyond our circumstances. Sometimes in difficult circumstances, we can still have, as we see here, great joy. You know, that's why a lot of people don't want to be Christians, because they look at us and they look at our circumstances and they say, I'd be miserable in those circumstances. But to us, in this great God that we serve, this great God who is full of grace, as he said up there in and verse 1, makes himself known to us how and when, just to, you know, get rid of ourselves. That's how we learn about God. No one can humble us like God can humble us. No one can take us through trials and tribulations and afflictions and bring us out with joy on the other side like God can. And that's what Paul says. So our circumstances do not dictate our joy. We can be in terrible circumstances and still have as Paul puts it here, abounding joy. And, and he says there, their deep poverty. It's a, it's a deep, deep poverty in the Greek. It means they were extremely impoverished. You, couldn't, you can't go any poorer than they are. They're clear on the bottom, bottom uh, rung of being in poverty. They're all the way at the bottom. And, you know, people in the Middle East, during these times, as much like the third world countries today, there were a lot of slaves, 
former slaves as well. And as you read these letters, you, you see that. So, you know, slaves just a lot of times didn't have a lot to give. And, and Paul says, out of their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So it would be a terrible mistake to ask the poor for 10%, wouldn't it? And it would be just as big a mistake to tell the poor that they can't give. Because Paul says they can, and they did, out of their deep poverty. Linsky said this about this verse. He said, no one stood up and said, hey, we're dirt poor. Why didn't somebody take up an offering for us? They didn't do it. They looked at things a different way. And uh, Paul says the riches of their liberality. Their riches, what are their riches? That's their spiritual wealth. That's what we have in Christ. That's why the world thinks we're cuckoo. Because we have Christ. Someday we're going to be like him. Someday we're going to be with him. Someday we're going to see those streets of gold. Someday we're going to see those pearly gates. We have great riches beyond hitting a lottery, beyond anything this world can give us. Those are the riches that we have, no matter how deep your poverty is on this earth. God will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't care how poor you are. I don't care what you have or don't have. God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise from him. That's a promise from this God of grace up there in verse 1. And Paul says their liberality there, he ends verse 2 with their liberality. He, they made their poverty their joy. That's what they did. They took their, the worst thing, which was their poverty, and they made it their joy and their liberality. They took their freedom and did that took their freedom in Christ and did that. You know, only God can turn our misery into joy. I can't do it. I can't do it for myself, let alone for you. But God can. God has that ability to take misery and turn it into joy. And sometimes he can do it through giving and giving to others. And that's what Paul talks about there in verse 2. Now we come to verses 3 through 5. So verses 3 through 5 is an explanation of verses 1 and 2. So Paul opens up with more detail. So just like chapters 8 and 9 go together, verses 3 through 5 go together. Now look what we've already learned. In verses 1 to 3, great affliction. These, these believers were in great affliction. And Paul says, in spite of their poverty. So they were dirt poor, and they gave with great joy, and they gave beyond their means. That's what they did. Those folks there in verse 2. And now, in verses 4 through 6, we see... They're going to give of their own free will. They begged Paul to participate. They are at Paul's disposal, and they gave beyond Paul's expectations. All those things are here. Now, just as we said, we love going through this verse by verse. You see that little word gave down there in verse 5? It's between first and themselves, that verb gave. That's what all this is tied to. They gave. First gave themselves because they were uh, they had the they had the right priorities in their life. What's the right priorities in your life? Romans, um, and Matthew six thirty three. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else will be added unto you. That is having God in a proper position in your life. For me as well. So that's what they did. They had God first. So they had God first, therefore they could do all these other things. They could give. They could give of themselves. They could offer themselves, and it was all the will of God as he, as he puts it here. So the word gave here governs the entire sentence. Now back up to 
verse 3, he says, for to their power or beyond their power. That means beyond their means, beyond their limits. They went beyond their limits. They went beyond their means. They gave beyond what they had the capacity to give. You know, we have guys at work that they try to, they try to crowd a one-hour meeting in a 15-hour time slot. <laughs> not good. Well, Paul here is not trying to do that at all. He's, it's the opposite. They gave beyond their means, beyond their limits, not according to their ability, but beyond it. He, he says to the utmost of their ability. And we can use another word, sacrificially. They gave sacrificially. That's what he says in verse 3, for to their power. They gave sacrificially, not 10%. And I bear witness, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So it's not just their fair share. They went beyond their fair share. And now in verse 4, begging us or beseeching us or praying us, they're begging Paul to participate. Isn't that incredible? That we would receive the gift to take upon us the fellowship, so the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. So don't make the mistake of measuring them based upon their ability. So if you read verse 2 and you considered all those things, you would have said, not such good circumstances, not such great people considering everything that's going on. But Paul said, no, they went beyond their power and beyond their ability and beyond their means. So don't measure them that way because they're going to exceed everything that Paul thought there in verse 4. And then he says, willingly. So now we see their motive. They are willingly. For their power, I bear witness, yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So it wasn't something that Paul demanded. It wasn't something Paul asked for. It wasn't a tithe. It wasn't 10%. Paul never asked for anything like that. And as he said over there in chapter 9, verse 7, they gave not grudgingly or out of necessity, or reluctantly, there was no external force upon them. It was a voluntary free will. Tied back to verse 1 where he said, the grace of God. So they were motivated by the grace of God and their own free will to give. Just like Jesus, remember when he came, he said, I didn't come to do my own will, I come to do the will of my Father. That's what this church said. Not our will, but God's will be done. Not what we want, but what God wants. So God is using this church. The churches of Macedonia are accomplishing, uh, down in verse 5, the will of God. And no human influence here. It was of their own free will. Just a single motive here. And then if you will, look in verse 4. There are four things in verse 4. There's the privilege, there's sharing, there's serving, and there are saints. So giving, here's why this, here's why this, uh, here's why tithing won't work. Because giving is not an obligation, it is a privilege. Giving is not an obligation, it's a privilege. And that's what Paul says here. It's a privilege to give. And, and again, it's not the gift itself, that's something else. So it's, it's the part, the, the actual giving part here that Paul's talking about. The sharing is a privilege. The act of giving is a privilege. You know, and when unsaved people see the church and see money, and they think that's what the church is all about. If I go to church, I'm obligated to give. Well, no, there's no obligation to give. We're motivated to give by the grace of God. We give generously. We give willingly. And he says here, they first willingly gave of themselves. So, you know, it's very important 
on the foreign mission field as well. I've had the chance to go to South Africa and talk to the church over there that Mike and Marie started. And I was there for a couple of weeks talking to some of those guys and gals there. And you know, one of the most amazing things to those, those folks in South Africa is that Mike never asked for a dime. He's over there serving the Lord, starting a church, and never asked them for a dime. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. There's no, uh, there's no, um, what do we say? There's no uh, loopholes in the gospel. Not to pay the preachers, not to pay the ministers. And that was, a, that was an amazing thing to those folks that a group of people over here in America would send a person like Mike and Marie over there at our own expense to take them this free gospel. And that's what Paul says. It's a privilege to give. This is the will of God. This is the glory of God here. This is the glory of Christ. That's what's at stake here. That's why we need to get this right. And there's the sharing as well. So, and, and it's not just money. You know, it's fellowship. It's, it's in the Word of God. You know, I used to think that about my dear friend Thornton. We had he, and he was old. I was young. He, there's a lot of things that we, we didn't have in common, but the one thing we had in common was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we said that often to each other. That's what we've got in common, is this faith in this person, in this man, Jesus Christ, who has died for both of us. So we share in that fellowship of the gospel. And that's what Paul says. When we, when we are a part of the church, when we are a part of these things, when we give, not just money, but when we give ourselves and we give our time, we give, then we're sharing in these very important things that money cannot buy. That go around the world and wake people up to the truth of God. That somebody like God would love them enough to send somebody with the gospel that they might hear it. So, you know, what, what we have here then, it's not participation. It's not why we gather. We're not here to participate. We are here to fellowship. And that's what Paul says. We're fellowshipping in these things. We're sharing in these things. It's, it's a, there's a big difference between fellowship and participation. You go to a football game, you're participating. You go to work, you're participating. You vote, you're participating. You come to church, we're fellowshipping. There's a big difference. We're fellowshipping in the ministering, as he says there in verse 4, the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. So there is fellowship in serving. There is fellowship in serving. That's what Paul says. And it's just incredible fellowship. And those of you that serve, those of you that you know, have been on the mission field, those of you who speak, those of you who preach, those of you who teach, those of you who have Bible clubs, those of you who had ministry with, with kids and with, with teenagers and with adults, those of you that have ministered to the saints know what I'm talking about. There is something in this that just money can't buy. That's the fellowship of the ministering of the saints here. It's by definition, it's an ecumenical act of compassion. That's what it is by definition. That's what Paul says. It's the fellowship of the ministering of the saints, this ecumenical act of compassion that we have on one another when we minister. And then notice the role reversal here. Normally, you would have the person who had need of funds asking for them, right? Here you have people with funds asking for the opportunity to give them. We've got a big role reversal here. And that's what this church, these churches wanted to do. So the donors are uh, looking for receivers, and the receivers were the churches back in Jerusalem. Palmer said this about this section. He said, the crowning point of their generosity was complete and total self-surrender. That's what they did. 
They surrendered themselves to God in the ministering of the saints, in the fellowship of the saints. And, and Plummer said that's the crowning point of their generosity. So that's why we want to do everything in a biblical manner. That's why we want to listen to God. We want to do things God's way. We don't want to do things our way. And that's what Paul says here. They did things God's way. In verse 5, by the will of God at the end there. You say, well, when do these things take place? Well, turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. You know, some people, I'm not real good at ministering to the saints. I'm, I'm good here. Stick me up here and give me my Bible and let me preach. I can do this. But I'm not real good at ministering to the saints like a lot of you are. And, you know, you, you just disappear in doing that. You know, and here in Matthew chapter 25, in verse 35, if you got a red letter Bible, this is Jesus speaking. If you got a black letter Bible, this is Jesus speaking. And he said, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous said, Lord, when did we see you hungry? You just do it. You just feed people, and you just take care of people, and you just you just go about doing what he said up there in verses 35 and 36, and you don't even realize you're doing it a lot of times. But here it is. Jesus said, again, he's going to reward you for those things. When you minister to the saints, when you get lost in fellowship, and he says, and fed thee, or thirsty, and I gave thee to drink, when saw we thee a stranger, and I took you in, or naked, and clothed thee? When did I see you sick or in prison and I came to you? And the king will say, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you have done it, unto the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. So when we serve one another, we're serving Jesus. That's what he says. When we get lost in fellowship with one another, we're, we're doing what he says here in Matthew, and he's going to reward you for those things. So turn back to our text. So that's why we have to take action. That's why we take action. That's why Paul urges them to do these things. God's way. Because God's glory, Christ's glory, is at stake. And verse 5 is the gave. That's the action word that dominates these verses. And that's what blows up tithing. You know, tithing is mechanical. It's, it's, it's not even, you know, I'm not, I'm not even going to bash it. But that's not what Paul's teaching here. Something far, far greater. And then he says in verse 5, not as we had hoped. So that exceeds any 10% or whatever you want to put in there. Not as we had hoped. So they exceeded Paul's expectations. And Paul never asked them for anything. And this gave themselves against an action word. It's an action word of worship. And that's what you do. When Jesus said, when, when he said, you did this, and then they said, well, Lord, when did we do this? That's an act of worship. So when we fellowship and we get lost in what we're doing, and, and we're doing it for the will of God, we're doing it for the cause of God, we're doing it for the grace of God, we're doing it for somebody else, we get lost in all those things, Paul says here, it's the will of God. Verse 5, they gave themselves in an act of worship. And, uh, you know, just a willingness to let God reign and rule over them. And that's what we need to do. That's what discipleship is. It's, it's uh, getting rid of ourselves. It's sacrificing ourselves for him, for his cause. And that's what they did. That's putting, um, that's Matthew 6.33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Walensky said 
they made it a joy of robbing themselves. They made it a joy of robbing themselves. And they gave themselves to the Lord. Paul says here in verse 5, complete and total surrender. It's like the woman that washed Jesus' feet. Remember the first time you read that? First time I read that, I said what Judas said. Wow, Lord, wouldn't this have been used for something else other than washing your feet? A total, complete surrender of that woman. Her life, her money, everything she had or ever, ever had had, she poured it out on Jesus' feet. She gave herself to him. And that's what Paul's saying these folks did here in verse 5. They first gave themselves to the Lord. You know, when Paul's, he's, he knew them. He knew them. He's not surprised at their actions. He knew that, you know, this is, these, these people would probably be doing this, and they did do this. So Paul, he by no means is surprised here. He knows them well. And Paul says it's the will of God they submitted to Paul. They gave the money where Paul wanted. Paul knew the greatest need. Where was the greatest need? The mother church back in Jerusalem. Turn over to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Verse 8, the closer we get to the Lord, the closer we get like that woman pouring her perfume out on Jesus' feet, the closer we get to that, the more we're going to love one another. And here in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Paul says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. So that's what they did. That's what these saints did back here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Turn back to that section. So again, the closer we get to the Lord, the closer we're going to love one another. We're going to be doing these things. We're going to give ourselves, as he says here in verse 5, to the Lord first. And then Paul says in verse 6 here, Insomuch that we besought Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. How humble Paul is here. He takes no credit for himself in any of this. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, I'm shocked, I'm amazed. At what? The grace of God. On himself? No. He says, bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia up there in verse 1. Paul is amazed at the grace of God that was bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. Dear friends, the, there's nothing more amazing than the grace of God. In my life, in your life, and in the lives of those around us. So Paul urged Titus to return to Corinth and finish what he had started. And Titus had initiated this and Paul doesn't take any kind of credit or at all. He just says, I just get back there and finish what you started. And let everybody participate in that. And Titus is going to get the privilege. What's he going to get the privilege? Well, next week, we're going to get up to verse 8. Guess what giving does? It proves the sincerity of your love here in verse 8. So that's what Titus was going to get to do. He was going to get to prove the sincerity of his love by doing this. What a privilege to participate. And again, giving is not an obligation. Giving is a privilege. And we do and we give willingly. We give abundantly. Uh, we're, we're indebted to those who brought us the gospel. And we're indebted to those who preach the gospel. And that's as Paul puts it up there, the glory 
of Christ. So, you know, the grace of God just inspired them to do these acts of charity and love. And we have the privilege of sharing and seeing the ministry of the saints. Here in verse 1. So I hope you enjoyed it. We come to a close today. Father, we thank you for your word. And what a demonstration, Father, of giving here in this church and these churches. Father, out of their deep poverty um, came this abundant offering for the church back in Jerusalem. And to fellowship with the saints, Father, what a privilege we have to fellowship with the saints. And as Jesus said in Matthew 25, you've done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. Father, help us as Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says, to love one another. Help us to do these things, Father, and we thank you for your love for us, your grace for us. Father, when we were sinners, when we were separated from you, when we were enemies of God, your son died for us and paid for our sins in full, that we through him could have everlasting life. So we come to you in his name this morning, and we come to you in his work, thanking you for his blood, and we pray in his name. Amen. Stand, Lord, as we go from this place, loving you more, trusting you more. May the power of your love and the light of your word shine forth to a sin-dark